Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to the episode of Spitting Venom, aka the Venom Vlog, and we are starting Ultimate Week. All week we're going to talk about the Ultimate Comics, and if you don't know what that is, actually, uh, I don't blame you. It's uh, it's kind of a weird thing they did in comics for a while uh, that I actually was on board with. I kind of liked in the beginning, and then as it kept going, it started to pull me out of it, and then it got really bad towards the end, uh, and then they decided, decided to take the best parts of it, or some of the best parts of it, and fold it into the regular Marvel Universe, uh, because what else were they going to do, right? Uh, so what they did uh, in like early 2000s, I think it was, they decided to reboot, or uh, not even reboot they decided to do a new alternate universe take on characters like the avengers and they called them the ultimates they did ultimate x-men and ultimate spider-man and the goal was to kind of cater to something to audiences that may be going to see the movies that were coming out like the first x-men movies uh and also the first spider-man movies and sam raimi ones and so they were trying to build something like that like okay let's get something that is on the ground level people who don't want to read you know 30 40 years of continuity who want to just come in and just get the basic idea of these characters and see a new fresh take on them uh this is what we're going to do and then obviously this freed them up a lot. I think creatively it freed up Brian Michael Bendis and uh, Mark Millar and some of the other people that came in in this world to try to, cr you know, create this new uh, this new franchise or this new take on all these characters. And at first I think they did a good job, but then even though the world started with Mark Millar and Brian Bendis, even the continuity with just two guys kind of at the, at the helm of it with Bill Jameis and some of the other, you know, editors at Marvel at the time, they still screw screw it up. They screw up their own continuity. Even in this book right here that we're going to talk about, uh, Ultimate Venom, which is like issues 33 through 38 of Ultimate Spider-Man, and then also uh, issue 39, which is like an epilogue issue. And we're going to talk about that here today. And in that, they even reference the Fantastic Four and that Peter Parker's parents read like an article written by Reed Richards. And then, like, in the Fantastic Four comic, Reed Richards is probably a little bit younger or maybe about the same age as Peter Parker. So you're like, so Reed Richards wrote an article. Like, I know he's a prodigy and he's a genius, but he wrote an article about astrophysics or something at the age of eight. Uh, and then they don't even really talk about that in the Ultimate Fantastic Four comic. So already they had little things, and you could tell they had planned different things at certain points. And then when they came time to create other characters for the Ultimate Universe, uh, they just collided with the previous ideas they had. So even with just two writers and a couple editors they still couldn't keep everything together uh, but overall I actually really liked the beginning of the Ultimate Universe I thought it was really cool and the only thing that I stuck with was probably uh, I read all the Ultimate X-Men books all the Ultimate Fantastic Four books uh, but Spider-Man I read um, you know up until the Miles Morales stuff and then into those books I kept reading because I actually really liked the character of Miles Morales and for the first time I felt since the Ultimate Universe started they really did something truly different. They killed Peter Parker and they introduced a new kid to be Spider-Man. And I was like, wow, this is what I felt like the Ultimate book should have been about. Is a storyline where we had Peter Parker for like 100 issues and then he dies and now a new kid is stepping up to be the new Spider-Man. And that is something we never got in the main Marvel Universe. And so for that reason alone, I thought, okay, that part to me was a success. Even though I didn't like a lot of what Bendis does and I'm still not a big fan of his writing. Uh, case in point, we're going to talk about this book here I'm not a big fan of. Uh, but... His, a lot of his ideas and his executions can work. And I think that's why he has such a tremendous fan base is because when he's on, he's like 100% on. Um, but in this book, what, uh, you know, what he's trying to do is you know, we're not in the main Marvel Universe, so he gets to tell his own version of Venom. And some of the things he did were kind of interesting, but a lot, some of the things he did, I didn't find that interesting. And I thought they were kind of bland and boring and shows that he doesn't really have a love for characters like Venom or Carnage. Uh, you know, he's more of a fan of older Spider-Man villains like Scorpion and Dr. Octopus and stuff. So I thought he put really good takes and twists on those characters and Green Goblin being like a turning into a giant Hulk like Green Goblin monster because he kind of used super soldier serum in with his Oz, you know, formula that he was making to, to make him, you know, the Green Goblin and it turned him into like a Hulk type monster. And I'm like, all right, that kind of fits in because that's kind of what Bruce Banner did to become the Hulk in this universe. In the Ultimate Universe was he was messing with Super Soldier DNA. So it kind of fit. And I was like, all right, so some of this is working for me and some of these new takes on these characters I'm kind of liking. Uh, but with Ultimate Venom, this is the first time when I was reading this book, which I loved every issue of until, it, until this run here, I was like, okay, he completely, for me, missed the mark on Venom. Uh, basically what happens in this one, because it's an alternate universe, we are dealing with a Eddie Brock who is a kid. He is about a couple years older than Peter. Peter's about 15 years old in this ultimate universe. 
uh, and Eddie Brock's about 19, and he's like in college or 20, something like that. And uh, so he's like 19, 20 years old. And he's uh, apparently was a, a childhood friend of Peter Parker's. Peter Parker, in this point in the comics, he had just broken up with Mary Jane. He's, or she broke up with him. He's dealing with that. It's 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 very emotional for him as a teenager. He's like, oh, this is, I really like this girl, and we've been together for a while, and now she broke up with me, and you know, and, and it sucks. So life sucks right now. So he's in his attic or at Aunt May's house in her attic, uh, and Gwen Stacy has moved in with them because her family had passed away, and so now she's like, you know, Aunt May was like, hey, look, this young girl needs a home. Let's let her stay with us for a while. So Gwen Stacy, who's like a punk rock girl, she's not like the the goody little two shoes girl that we knew before. This girl is a little bit more like, you know, a skater chick kind of thing. Um, and so, they're, you know, they're, Aunt May and, and Gwen are downstairs talking about, you know, Peter being broken up with, uh, you know, and, and how he's dealing with it. And then Peter's upstairs going through his, his like, personal belongings, and he finds... Um, uh, uh, like a box full of stuff that his that belonged to his dad and his parents and this is all stuff Aunt May had put up in the attic and was like all right when Peter's old enough one day you know I'll show this stuff to him and so Peter's going through it and he's seeing some of the projects his father worked on and he finds a videotape and he puts a videotape on and he sees that uh, you know he sees a day in the park when from like 10 years earlier when like or not even 10 years like seven or eight years earlier uh, and when Peter was like seven years old and he's like on the videotape and he's seeing himself he's seeing his dad his mom Uncle Ben and Aunt May, you know, seven years younger, and he's seeing his best friend from childhood, Eddie Brock. So in this version, they decided to make Eddie Brock and Peter, you know, friends as kids. Even though uh, Eddie was a little bit older, uh, Eddie Brock's dad, Eddie Sr., uh, in this universe, not called Carl Brock, but uh, Eddie Brock Sr. in this universe, he was friends with Peter Parker's dad, and they were working on a special project together called the Venom Project, which already sent a bunch of lazy writing red bells off for me, because I'm like, really? You're going to call it the Venom Project? Like, how on the nose can you be? Uh, it's like in Resident Evil when they were like, I want him in the Nemesis program. It's like, it wasn't called the Nemesis program, uh, you know, when they started it. So... I don't know why they call it the Venom Project. Like, Peter's dad is supposed to be a good guy, so I don't know why he would work on something called the Venom Project, especially when you find out what the suit actually does, because uh, Peter's dad and Eddie's dad, they wanted the suit. They called it the suit. I guess their employers, the Trask Industries, who was, like, uh, you know, on, you know, the ones funding this project for them, and those were the scientists working on it, uh, they wanted to call it the Venom Project, I guess. Uh, but it made no sense, because really what the suit did is it would, it was like a black liquid. It would, you know, they would meld it with your DNA. It was kind of a little bit alive uh, so it kind of moved had a little bit of a mind of its own but uh, but you would mix your DNA in with it and then you would you know wear it it would like you know cover your body uh, and kind of cocoon you and what it would do is if you had cancer or any other kind of ailments like that it would work with your natural immunities in your body and enhance them so that they could fight back against cancer or whatever and you would be like in a, a comatose state I guess while this was happening you're wearing this you know black liquid around you and then once it killed everything they would remove the suit you wouldn't be harmed because they would mixed your DNA in with it already to kind of you know help you know, the process of, you know, bonding it with you and removing it. And uh, that was the fate. That was the, the the theory that they wanted to do was to help people, mostly people with cancer, but it could be applied to other things later on. And so it was like, okay, that's kind of a neat concept. Uh, but the big problem is, is then now you're taking out the, a little bit of the sci-fi element of it being an alien from outer space and it truly having a mind of its own because never in this storyline does the suit talk to Peter or talk to Eddie or anything like that or manipulate them or whisper in their ear or nothing like that. So you're taking out a big fundamental part of the suit uh, and you're just making it literally a suit it's like wearing Captain America's outfit like you're making it something that is just like oh it's clothing you put on it'll heal you and then you take it off or something and uh, and it, it to me it cuts the interest down big time on the character itself and it takes away a lot of potential story stories to tell uh, when you remove half of the equation in my opinion uh, so uh, so when you have you know Peter when he first gets the suit uh, he see he runs into Eddie Brock he decides to look him up after he watches his tape he's like hey I know that kid. Yeah, Eddie Brock. And Aunt May's like, you know what? You should look him up. See if he's still in New York. So Peter does. He's like, you know, and then Peter finds out that Eddie's parents died on the same plane that his parents died on, uh, which, you know, could have been a random thing. But now Peter's starting to think, oh, you know, I think my parents were killed by uh, Trask Industries. I think, you know, because my dad was working on this project, he's starting to piece together and think, oh, maybe they were actually killed because my dad wanted to take this project and go forward with it and they only got to phase two, so they didn't perfect it yet, they haven't got it to work, 
uh, and it's still kind of out of control. Uh, but uh, his dad wanted to go somewhere else, get more funding and work on it uh, with Eddie Brock Sr. And apparently that's when their plane went down. So Peter's kind of thinking maybe there's a bigger you know, scheme going on here. Maybe his parents were like killed as opposed to it being a random plane crash. And so, uh, so he's kind of going all over the place with that. He's still dealing with the breakup for Mary Jane. So obviously he's very emotional right now. So he goes and looks up Eddie Brock. He finds him in college and he says, hey man, like, you know, I'm Peter Parker. We knew each other as kids. And Eddie's like, hey dude, oh my God. So they start hanging out. Uh, Gwen Stacy hangs out with them. They all three start to become friends. Uh, Peter, you know, occasionally will see Mary Jane and, you know, kind of like he wants to go talk to her and Gwen's like, don't do it. And she broke up with you. Just let it go. You know, maybe she'll come to her senses later, but just kind of move on for right now. It's going to just hurt more and more the more you dwell on it. Uh, so she's trying to be a good friend to him. Uh, meanwhile, Eddie Brock, who's 20 and Gwen Stacy, who's 15, he's starting to hit on her and it's getting a little weird and a little creepy. Uh, and there's a scene where he ta he invites her back to his, uh, you know, his dorm, I guess, and uh, tries to hit on her and moves in for a kiss. And she's like, whoa, what are you doing? He's, she's like, I'm 15. He goes, yeah, but you know, like I thought the way you dress and everything and you came up to my room, I thought you would want to be into this. And, uh, and she's like, no, you freak get away. And so she leaves and, and he's like tease or whatever. And so you can see he's kind of a, a little bit of a creepy guy. You know, he's, uh, you know, likes younger girls, I guess. Um, and, uh, and you know, I don't know, that's, that's the kind of the picture they started to paint him in is that, uh, is that he kind of, you know, has that going because later on Peter talks to like his roommate who acts like kind of like a, uh, Eddie Brock's roommate who acts like a jerk like his dorm mate he's kind of a jerk to Eddie and then Peter later says hey why were you a jerk to him and he's like yeah because he kind of always brought young girls up and he always I you know always try to be kind of creepy around them and uh, and he was just like a weird dude and he you know never you know did this or he was never a good person or whatever so you're getting all these accounts from you know someone else uh, so you so Peter's kind of like all right I guess he wasn't a good guy after all so Eddie kind of has like this screw a little bit of a screw loose in his head and again that interpretation it's it's different uh, than the one we knew from before you know we knew Eddie as a journalist who was trying to make it and then you know screwed up big time and that ruined his life and then later you find out okay he's maybe he had a past that wasn't the best he wasn't you know maybe he wasn't on the path to ever be a good person uh, but he was probably at least redeemable this Eddie, the only two scenes they give him where he's kind of scumbaggy, you know, Bendis really lays it on. Okay, he's a scumbag. He's a scumbag because I only have these two scenes to write him and where Peter's not around and I want to show that he's a scumbag. But then any scenes where Peter is around, he acts like a decent, halfway decent person. So it's it's really the inconsistency there. I know Eddie is trying to put this mask on of like he's trying to be something he's not in front of Peter. Uh, but so I get what Bendis was going for there. But when you're in a comic, you can't it doesn't, those things don't really, uh, you know, are full effective. You, you got to kind of make them a little bit more layered as either a bad guy or a good guy. You can't, you know, doing back and forth from scene to scene just felt a little off to me in this storyline. It seemed like uh, Bendis didn't have a grasp on who he wanted the character to be. Uh, and that's how Eddie Brock comes to me, uh, you know, comes across to me in this story. So when uh, he, Eddie and Peter talk, Eddie brings him to a lab and says, hey, I work for Dr. Kirk Connors, who is the lizard. And he says, uh, hey, I work for Dr. Kirk Connors. And this is an area he let me keep the, my dad's work in. And he pulls out the alien symbiote. And then Peter, uh, you know, and him talk. And Eddie Brock leaves. And Peter comes back later that night as Spider-Man. And he wants to destroy it because he's like, you know what? This could have got my dad killed or whatever. I want to, I, I kind of want to destroy it, but I also want to do a little bit of work on it. Maybe I can complete his research. Maybe Eddie and I can work on this together, but I want to work on it a little bit by myself first and especially when he finds out that his dad's DNA is mixed in with this first batch. So Peter gets a little bit on his arm and it senses his DNA and it starts spreading the way it's supposed to, although it is out of control because his dad never perfected the formula. So it starts spreading up, wraps around him, and turns him into black costume Spider-Man. And for a whole issue, Peter goes out there and he tries to save the day. He helps like a young um, actress, pop singer lady in her limo. She gets attacked by somebody. Peter shows up and beats that guy down. He goes a few blocks away, com comes across the shocker, uh, uh, Herman Schultz. And in this version, he's kind of more of a joke character. He's got like these gloves and he's wearing a purple jacket. He's not wearing the, you know, the, the yellow pin, you know, cushion suit or whatever. And, uh, and he gets an encounter with him. The shocker shoots his vibrational things at uh, the suit 
which in normal continuity actually would hurt him a little bit. Uh, but in this one, it didn't. And, and you know, he just kind of looks at him. He's like, oh, that tickles. And then black costume Spider-Man takes down uh, the shocker. And then he goes a few more blocks and he sees, you know, now he's like, all right, I'm super fast. I'm much faster than I used to be. When he shoots his webbings, it's just the alien symbiote coming out of his fingertips. So he's just like with ease moving around the city, jumping over things, lifting things that are heavier than he could before. So he's like seeing the advantages of having this suit. And then he goes a few blocks and sees that uh, some random guy got shot by a mugger, just like his Uncle Ben did. And he chases that mugger down, leads him into an alley, grabs him, and he gets so mad. And he starts remembering what happened to Uncle Ben. And, he's, and he gets mad at himself for not being able to stop this from happening, that the suit comes to life and it actually turns into Venom. Uh, or what we know Venom to be. And so, uh, so you know, the art by Mark Bagley is fantastic throughout this whole run. Obviously, you know, he's a, that guy's a professional. He's awesome. Uh, but the storyline to me had ups and downs. But this to me was an up moment when Peter, like, loses it and the suit goes out of control and Peter realizes, holy crap, this thing is not a good thing. And it's, it's messing with his mind. It's starting to seep into his pores and his skin and his DNA. And it's manipulating him and it's taken over and it's doing exactly what his father's notes said something like this could do if it went wrong is that it's not perfected yet and it's not doing what it needs to do and it's not healing Peter it's it's corrupting him and so Peter is like all right I got to fight back and so he goes and tries to tear the suit off and then what ends up happening is a bunch of cops come out and they're trying to shoot him because you know Spider-Man's still not the most you know loved guy in New York City at this point and he's still young in his career and the cops are shooting at him he gets shot and then his, the wound heals and, and you know and he's like ah and the suit starts going out of control tries to kill a few cops and then Spider-Man jumps away I think it gets hit by a clothesline or like a power line comes down, hits him and electrocutes the suit. And you find out electricity is actually now a weakness of this new version of the black alien suit, which is not an alien, obviously, but it's a, it's a weakness to it. So he gets electrocuted and he gets thrown a few blocks coincidentally into a graveyard that happens to be where his mom and dad are buried, which you're like, again, lazy story, lazy story cutting. And I hate moments like that because it's like, dude, really? He couldn't have just landed somewhere else. Like it had to land right in front of the grave of his mom and dad. Uh, you know, I, I believe in coincidence and storyline sometimes, but not that much of one. Uh, so, so yeah, that was a little bummer, but you know, a bit of a bummer, but Peter did get free from the suit and that was the main point there. And so he goes back and he tries to, he goes back to the lab and he tries to get rid of the suit, but then that's when Eddie Brock comes in and catches him. When Eddie Brock sees that Peter is like in the lab, dirtied up, you know, wearing like, you know, clothes he probably found in the dumpster. He smells like trash and he sees him like footprints on the wall. He starts to piece together. He's like, dude, are you Spider-Man? He's like, did you take my suit? Because Eddie, after he hit on, you know, Gwen, he turned on the TV. And after she left, he turned on the TV and saw Spider-Man being shot at by the cops. And he saw Spider-Man in the black costume. And he was like, holy crap, someone stole my dad's work. So he runs down to the lab and that's where he runs into Peter Parker, who was trying to take the suit and dispose of it. And he says, look, Eddie, you have to let me take this. And he's trying to explain to him and, you know, which I like this scene. I like that Bendis wrote a dialogue scene to try to, you know, have Peter nip this in the bud. He didn't want another friend to become an enemy. He doesn't want to create more tension. He doesn't want more people hating him. He's like, look, dude, here's what's going on. I'm just a normal kid. I got bit by a spider. A lot's going on. I can't handle all this. I find out my dad might have been killed, that your dad might have been killed with my dad and our parents might have died in a plane crash that was planned and not random. Uh, I find out that they were working on something and that now it's alive and I put it on and it, you know, it, it caused me to do horrible things and possibly almost kill somebody. He's like, this thing is dangerous and neither of us need it in our lives. And if we want to complete our dad's research, our, you know, our mutual dad's research, we need to do it a different way and we can't do it with this. This thing is too dangerous and too volatile to have around. So you've got to trust me. Let me destroy it. So Eddie like takes a big breath. He's like, fine, let me just go process all this, you know, whatever. And then so he leaves thinking that maybe Peter would feel bad enough to leave the suit. But when Eddie t waits five minutes, he comes back in and he sees the suit has been taken and, and Peter went up, brought it to like a, you know, like a, a smokestack at like a furnace area and he drops it down and burns it all up. Uh, Eddie's like, holy crap, that little twerp actually took it. So he goes over and he says, well, luckily I still have mine from my father. And he goes over to another uh, like cylinder, like, you know, like another freezing unit, opens it up and sees another bat of ooze uh, labeled Brock. And so Eddie takes that pours it on his hand and becomes Venom. And at first it's not an easy transformation. It's, it, you know, Eddie does not have the powers of Spider-Man, so he couldn't handle the transformation as easily as Peter could. So once it did, it, it wrapped around him, but there was one element missing in his uh, strand or his uh, bottle that said Brock on it. It did still have Parker DNA mixed in with it. So he realizes he needs at least some, if not all of Peter's blood to maintain control of the suit. 
So he immediately wants to go eat and drain Peter Parker. Uh, but before he can get to him, he needs to pull himself together, which he can't do. He's just a blobby mess on the ground. So as people come in and like researchers come in, they're like, hey, what's going on in here? You know, like I heard an alarm or something went off and they come in and Eddie, you know, the blob eats them and sucks them dry and takes all their, you know, juices and insides and, you know, everything they have that makes them a human being, drains them completely out and then drops like, you know, a, basically a, a corpse on the ground, like a, a dried up corpse and uh, drops them on the ground. And he, so he, eat, he eats like two or three people, a couple security guards. And after doing that, he's able to at least make a form of like you know two legs two arms and he's this big hulking mess kind of like what we saw in that ice sculpture he's like this big mess tentacles coming out of his back and he is a little purple a lot of people make comments about the purple on him and i think really the the reason that's is is because i think because without the spider on his chest although when peter had the black suit for you know that one issue he had the white spider on his chest but when Venom had it, it's a different uh, liquid that Eddie Brock put on him. So it doesn't have those, you know, memories. It didn't, it didn't pull powers from Peter Parker or nothing like that. So it didn't have a black spider on him. So this is something that could tie into the movie on why he doesn't have a spider is because obviously there's no Spider-Man around. So he's this like big mess and he's trying to keep it together. And, uh, and the reason I think the purple is there is a, it's just a coloring technique. I think it's uh, for lighting. Uh, so it's, it is actually a black suit with just like certain lighting, making it look purple. Because like I always say, you can't just have something pure black. Uh, you know, sometimes you need things to break it up to make it look visually interesting. And I think it was just a decision Mark Bagley and the colorist probably made together to add some purple highlights in there um, or purple sections, depending on how light hits it, uh, to, you know, to give it a different look so that it didn't uh, just look solid black and boring. They wanted to add something to it, but it does come with it. A lot of people think, oh, the suit is black and purple in the Ultimate Comics or just purple. And that's actually not true. If you look at any of the toys, most of the toys that were made on the Ultimate Comics, uh, and if you look at like, you know, the suit when it comes back later on in the Miles Morales book, um, and that it's all black. It's like pitch black. So I think this was just a coloring lighting uh, thing for the most part. But you know, I know a lot of people out there like the purple. I'm a I'm a Prince fan. I have been my whole life. I love the color purple. Uh, so I don't mind the purple on there. But I think really, truly, the suit isn't purple. It's black and just has some purple highlights for lighting reasons uh, and to make it look not so flat uh, on these pages. Because a lot of these scenes take place in shadow and it would kind of get lost in the shadow or the details would get lost. And I know Bagley probably just wants his artwork to be seen and appreciated. So it would probably be easier just to add some purple highlights uh, to the look. Uh, but uh, it, so in the book, Peter, he's, um, you know, now he has to deal with Eddie Brock. Eddie Brock comes and challenges him. And this is where I don't like Bendis's writing the most. This is a trope he has done, I think, two or three times before issue 33. So when he does it again in this uh, run, it made me really mad. Uh, what he would do is he would write four or five issues of the battle building up nicely and organically between Spider-Man and whatever villain, Doc Ock, Green Goblin, whoever. And then what he would do is the last issue of the story, it would be told in flashback. So it would start off and you see Peter Parker is fine and well. He's either hanging out with Mary Jane or by himself and he's like just talking to himself and he's narrating what happened in the final battle. And it drove me nuts that for like the third time in 30, nine issues bendis did it again with this storyline it was really bothering me um and this was at the time i was like 22 at the time and i remember just being furious i'm like dude how does a guy like this who you know makes a career writing like how does he use the same trope and nobody calls him out on it uh so th it really drove me nuts to see that the book opened and Peter's alive and well. And of course, we know he's going to be, but we'd like to see the tension, uh, you know, when he's fighting Venom. Is he going to make it out? How is he going to make it out? But if you see he's already alive, it takes all the wind out of the rest of the issue. So the last issue is just uh, Eddie shows up at Peter's school, and it's a rainy day, and he shows up on the, you know, field, like the, the football field, and he's staring in at a classroom where Peter is, and Peter looks out the window and sees Eddie, and then he has to sneak out of class to go fight Eddie one-on-one -on -one without a Spider-Man costume in a, you know, in a football field at his high school and I was like well that's a cool setting for a battle it's a, it adds a lot of tension because who's going to see him is are they going to see Peter Spider-Man uh, what's going to happen and the battle gets really intense they fight there and then they fight into other areas and they go you know a couple blocks away and they fight into the city and Peter has to wear a hood like pulls up his hoodie and zip you know zips it to try to keep his identity be, from being revealed from normal people and he's fighting the whole battle without his costume and I was like this is great these are two friends fighting 
Peter and uh, and Eddie Brock. And I was like, this is the type of stuff I like. But when you open the book with showing me Peter's already alive, it takes all the wind out. So for me, I was like, well, obviously Peter's going to get out of this. And I don't even really care how now because I already know he's fine and in one piece. So when you're I'm reading this, I was like, oh, this would be so much better if the first two pages showing Peter was alive was just cut completely. If I was an editor, I would have cut those pages completely and just had the battle just go. Because this is a good fight. I think the artwork's great. Bigley does one of my favorite things where Venom gets his jaw punched. I think Ed, in this one, Peter grabs a tire and uppercuts Eddie, uh, or the Venom suit, and it closes his jaw on the tongue, and the tongue, you know, gets bit off and flies off in the air. And I love when, uh, it, it, Bagley has done that two or three times in the comics, and I love when he does that, where Peter just hits uh, Eddie so hard that the tongue gets bit off. Um, so that was a cool moment. The battle was really cool, and then at the end, Eddie gets a little taste of Spider-Man. He absorbs him for a little bit, and he's able to get, you know, a little bit more control of the suit. But Peter breaks out. They get into a fight, and then another explosion. Electricity comes down, and we think Eddie Brock dies and evaporates. Of course, you don't get any closure, and you can just tell Bendis wanted to just end the book you know, as fast as he could and without any, you know, just wanted to get it and move on. And that's clear as day when you read this. It's like, all right, Venom's just gone. And then Peter's like, well, what happened? Did he die? Did he not die? And then he spends like the whole last issue, the epilogue issue, issue 39. It's just Peter going to talk to Nick Fury, asking him, hey, did you know my how my parents died? Were they murdered? Do you know? And, and Nick Fury's like, dude, I was in college when your parents died. Like it was like, I, or I was in India when your parents died. I had no idea. I wasn't involved with S.H.I.E.L.D. or none of this stuff. He's like, so I don't know what you're talking about man he's like I i'm sorry your parents died i'm sorry this eddie brock kid turned out to not be a friend that's gonna happen you know like last time i had a friend my eye got you know took out so he's like you know it's just gonna it's just one of those things man it's like life sucks and he's like uh but you know if you need someone i'll be here for you and so nick fury is kind of in the ultimate comics the what tony stark is to peter in the you know marvel cinematic universe he's kind of the mentor type and it's pretty neat to see that because uh nick fury has a soft spot for this kid uh when he shouldn't he has a soft spot for nobody but he does for this kid and he feels for this kid. So that was a good issue, that that part of it. Uh, but then Peter finds, you know, maybe traces of Eddie, goes back to his uh, dorm, talks to Eddie's, you know, former roommate, and he's like, yeah, Eddie's gone, all of his stuff's gone, I just assumed he moved out, I don't know what's going on. So we get hints that Eddie's still alive. Um, but uh, the final issue, the epilogue, I thought was a really strong one because it showed Peter searching for answers, which he's been trying to do since the Ultimate book started. So I liked that that theme was still in there and still tied in. But the overall take on Venom, I thought, suffered because the suit wasn't an alien, or at least it wasn't something with an actual mind of its own to talk to Eddie or Peter with. I thought that would have added a lot more to the story. Uh, but at the end of the day, the story is just about two friends, people who were together, you know, friends when they were younger, and then how they grow apart. And so it's kind of the Harry Osborn uh, effect a little bit, but just with Eddie Brock. And although I don't like that fully, I do appreciate different takes on characters and it did feel different than the main universe. So for me, I'm like, well, it lives up to the ultimate title if it feels nothing like the old universe. So for that, I give Bendis major points for. Uh, but let me know what you guys think. I mean, this storyline, it's okay. It's available on digital and in print still. I think it's called Ultimate uh, Ultimate Spider-Man Volume 6 Venom. And you can pick it up. You could probably find the hardcover in a $5 bin somewhere. I know I saw it at Legacy Comics recently for $5. And uh, it's, it's a pretty, it's worth reading. If you're a Venom fan, I think it's worth reading. It's not my favorite take on Venom and it's certainly not uh, a story that I, I I loved when it came out and it's certainly not a story I love now, but I see hints of interesting things in there. Uh, whether it's something I would have done if I was writing that story or not is irrelevant because I take things for what they are and I just, I, it's half the story I liked and half of the story I didn't. So I'm kind of 50-50. Uh, but I'm even more down on the next story, which is Ultimate Carnage. And we will talk about that in the next episode. So for now, let me know what you think of all the stuff I said today. What do you think of Ultimate Venom? Are you a fan of it? Do you know anything about it? Uh, and if you do, let me know some of your favorite moments down below, favorite moments from these issues or the upcoming ones. Let me know. And yes, for those who want to know, after Ultimate Carnage, we are going to talk about the Ultimate Spider-Man video game. And I'll have clips from the game and all that stuff uh, playing on screen. So that's going to be a lot of fun. That'll be on Wednesday's episode. So uh, tune in for that. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel. And uh, that's all I got to say in this episode. I think I talked long enough. So let me know again what you think down below. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And I'll see you in the future, guys. Peace.